Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much again for joining us for today's webinar, Living Well with Migraine, Embracing Wellness in the Face of Chronic Disease. I'm Katie Schubert, President and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research. SWHR is the thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and improving women's health through science, policy, and education. We're pleased today to have four distinguished panelists joining us. Dr. Yelena Pavlovich, Dr. Don Bust, and two fantastic patient advocates, Karen Smith and Jamie Sanders. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of today's virtual public forum, Amgen, Impel, Lily, Eli Lilly, and Novartis. And we invite participants to use the Q&A box to ask questions. We will be uh, monitoring that box and moderating a Q&A session in the latter portion of the event. We'll be um, looking to that box again for questions and common themes that might arise. We will also be live tweeting the event. Um, if you're tweeting about it as well, please use the hashtag SWHRTalksMigraine. Migraine is a common neurological disease that affects an estimated 18% of women across the United States. Symptoms can include debilitating headaches as well as nausea and sensitivity to noise and light. Migraine is three times more common in women than men, and women are more likely to experience longer and more intense migraine attacks and higher levels of disability. For many, managing migraine disease requires both medical and behavioral strategies, and we're here today to learn about the lifestyle choices those with migraine may be able to make to improve their quality of life. I'd like to now turn it over to SWHR's Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs, Dr. Melissa Leitner, to touch briefly on the concept of wellness and migraine. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everyone. As Katie mentioned, my name is Melissa Leitner. I lead SWHR's policy efforts, but I'm also a clinical psychologist. So I've been able to direct some of my interests in emotional well-being in the face of chronic illness towards our work on migraine here at SWHR. Our Migraine Network was founded three years ago to draw awareness to research gaps and unmet needs in migraine care. Our network consists of researchers, clinicians, and policy and patient advocates, several of whom you'll be meeting today, and all of whom are passionate about improving care for those with migraine. Our network has developed two migraine toolkits for patients on their journey through diagnosis, treatment, and long-term management of their symptoms. So this first one, a migraine patient toolkit, a guide for your care, is designed to help patients understand the basics of migraine diagnosis and treatment. And our second toolkit, which we just released this summer, is entitled Living Well with Migraine. The goal of our wellness toolkit is to empower migraine patients to feel more in control of their condition. So we focus on wellness because it refers to the pursuit of activities that contribute to a state of overall health and well-being. For people with migraine, combining medical treatments with wellness strategies can help improve quality of life. The toolkit, as well as today's webinar, focuses on wellness strategies across multiple areas, physical, environmental, emotional, social, and intellectual wellness. We have four experts from our network here with us to discuss these concepts today, so I'm going to turn it back over to Katie to introduce our first speaker. Great, thanks so much, Melissa. I'd like to introduce Dr. Yelena Pavlovich. Dr. Pavlovich is a practicing neurologist at the Montefiore Headache Center and an assistant professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She's also a physician scientist who holds a PhD in molecular medicine. Her research interests focus on hormonal regulation of migraine in women, and she'll be talking today about physical and environmental aspects of wellness. Dr. Pavlovich, thank you for joining us. Feel free to go ahead and share your screen. Thank you so much for that introduction, Katie. Uh, do you see my screen appropriately? Yes, we can see. I would like to thank uh, SWHR for um, your commit continued uh, commitment to the field of migraine and uh, the debilitating effect that migraine has on community at large and especially on women and women of reproductive age. So I will speak briefly to environmental and physical wellness across the lifespan with respect to the lives of women. So we know that migraine affects women 
on two time scales. And that is the time scale of the, in terms of the hormonal regulation specifically and differently than men. And that is the time scale of the menstrual cycle and the time scale of the lifespan as hormones change throughout the lifespan in women. And we know that it migraine particularly affects women of in, during their reproductive years. This is the time when 50% of women with migraine experience menstrually related attacks, which occur around the time of menstruation. And these are thought to be the most, uh, these are described as tremendously disabil disabilitating, uh, generally worst in severity and burden, generally harder to treat, longer lasting, refractory to treatment. And at this time, women often experience additional symptoms such as sleep disturbances, mental stressors, different diet cravings such as chocolate, carbohydrates, which also may work as triggers for migraines. So one can end up in a kind of a catch-22 cycle. Um, in the lead up to the period. And um, all of this leads to complex potential trigger, triggering of migraine attacks, which can make it even worse than it is without uh, these factors playing a role. Therefore, tracking the menstrual cycle and tracking the lifestyle factors that play a role in migraine in women of reproductive age is very important. Um, some other things of how migraine is affected during the lifespan of women is that due to hormonal stabilization during pregnancy, thankfully most women experience improvement in their headaches in frequency and severity of migraine attacks. This can sometimes be reactivated, as I'm sure a lot of our audience knows, but after giving birth. But women who breastfeed can delay that process and have um, kind of lower headache frequency post-delivery because, again, of hormonal control. Finally, menopausal transition, which uh, is not as most people comprehend. And we were even taught in medical school, menopause occurs as if it's a magical day when menopause happens. And from that day, everything is different. It's actually a transition. And it's a transition that takes about a decade on average in United States. That is a long time. And this decade of menopausal transition is characterized by a number of symptoms, including worsening often in headache frequency in women who already have migraine, unfortunately. And often these women have other symptoms of uh, perimenopause and menopausal transition that are worsened and increased during this time, such as vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes and night sweats and so on. Postmenopause, thankfully, many women with migraine experience a decrease in migraine attacks, though there's a select few that do not, but a majority, the situation improves. So now, Understanding this, understanding that their internal, you know, estrogen and hormonal fluctuation being the ultimate endogenous triggers. We can't change our bodies. We can't change our genetics. We do not want to really majorly interfere on hormonal changes in some respects, yes, but not as to uh, at one point, oophorectomies were done as treatment for migraine. We do not want to go down that path. But the path that we can um, emphasize and teach and practice is some control of the environment and migraine triggers. And improved understanding of these can really help women. So how to best mitigate some of these factors by adopting what seem to be fairly uh, established and basing influences on physical and or mental wellness strategies. So if we look at this wonderful mnemonic of seeds and uh, so nicely presented in this slide created by SWHR of really focusing on our wellness by paying attention to sleep, to nutrition, what is what is being eaten, to exercise, to drink, to stress. These are the factors that have been shown again and again to play a role in migraine progression, in migraine triggering of individual attacks, in um, migraine outcomes and how migraine uh, behaves and what is the burden of migraine and what attacks present as. So, 
it one should not um, underestimate the importance of all of these factors that play a role in migraine. How can we uh, interfere? How can we practice this wellness? Um, so activities like physical activity. Uh, we know that women, we know from WAM study, uh, that women with migraine often avoid exercise because they're afraid that exercise may trigger migraine. Um, they may avoid um, even, and so this leads to increased sedentary behavior, which we know in turn is worse for migraine and leads to increasing weight, which is also worse for migraine. So even a simple weight, a simple exercise interventions. The best exercise is an activity you enjoy. So if it's running around with kids, uh, you know, I try to do TikTok moves, uh, doesn't work, but it, it's a movement. Uh, so um, what, whatever it may be that keeps you moving, do it five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. There was just a study that came out showing that 11 minutes a day may be the magic number. Uh, however many minutes will, be, will help. Um, improved sleep. Uh, sleep hygiene is an essential component that is often neglected, particularly because of stress. Um, it's so hard to get and to regulate sleep, but it's so essential for a sensitive migraine brain to do so. So go to bed and wake up at the same time, have a relaxing bedtime routine, and absolutely turn off electronic devices and blue light in particular, because that it's the blue light that stimulates at least 30 minutes before bedtime. I would advise even sooner. Um, and then, you know, eat regularly. Um, studies of triggering of food have really not panned out that, you know, specific foods trigger migraine and so on. And as a food lover, I can never recommend anyone to eliminate foods from their diet. But if you know, you know your body best, if something seems to trigger it, if something seems to bother you, sometimes can be just transient preparations of a certain things and, and not forever. Avoid it. You, again, you know your body best and what works for you better than your doctor can advise you in this regard. So, but make sure to eat regularly, to not skip meals and hydration, hydration, hydration. I cannot emphasize how important this is. Um, dehydration, not the clinically relevant dehydration, but just kind of feeling depleted in hydration is essential for people with migraine. All in all, there are also environmental factors that we sometimes can't do much about. Um, and these can help us uh, determine, some of them can be tracked, some of them can be tracked as well. Common tra triggers of these are changes in altitude, changes in barometric pressure, can't do much about, but we can anticipate them. And sometimes we can preemptively treat. If you know that major storms always trigger your migraine and you see that a major storm is arriving, you can actually pre-treat with your acute treatment. Smells, noise. Interestingly, uh, a lot of this in our homes we can control and have, you know, I'm sure as majority of people with migraine have lights set up as I do a whole set of lights. Um, and we can follow, keep a headache diary and headache diary is very helpful, not only to one's own understanding of their triggers and where their migraine occurs, but also of sharing it with their healthcare provider so that they can together best come with guidance on it. This particularly is important for menstrually related migraine, which can really be extremely helpful keeping those headache diary days um, uh, very well defined. I think we're I'm running short of time. I will finish quickly with uh, some accommodations we can uh, have at the workplace, uh, which can often be very difficult to navigate for a person with migraine. Um, we know that uh, migraine causes major uh, loss of work days annually in US and throughout the world. And uh, you should be your own advocate and um, also enroll those who can help you to um, advocate for accommodations at workplace, uh, some of which are uh, presented here. 
thankfully, one of the silver linings of the pandemic strangely has been that for those who have been lucky to be able to work from home, uh, a lot of our patients are reporting that those headaches are not as much triggered because there's no exposure to different scents, odors, um, you know, t lights that don't work them. Um, so my hope for the future is that uh, there are downsides to working from home and being on Zoom, but also that as this become mainstream, that we can incorporate and understand that um, work accommodations uh, really vary from person to person and people with migraine may require specific work recommendations, accommodations um, that now may be easier to make. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pavlovich. This is really helpful. Um, I'd like to now invite Dr. Dawn Buse to share her screen. Dr. Buse is a clinical professor of neurology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and a licensed uh, psychologist. She conducts research on migraine pain and chronic disease and how these factors impact important parts of life. She also has a really great website that offers free guided relaxation exercises and visual imagery, and I would encourage you all to check that out. Um, Dr. Abuse, I'm delighted to welcome you to present on emotional wellness and migraine. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Dr. Pavlovich, and thank you to Society for Women's Health Research, and of course, our other panelists as well, Karen and Jamie. I'm looking forward to hearing you both, as always. So I'm excited to talk about emotional wellness, and we all know that living with migraine or any other chronic illness is hard. It's just objectively hard. It is a painful, unpredictable, debilitating disease. We wouldn't wish it on anybody. It's not an easy way to live your life, not knowing when an attack might happen, or if you're someone who lives with very frequent attacks, not even knowing when you will have a good day or be less disabled. People living with migraine or chronic illness right now in 2020, in December of 2020, when we're filming this, if you're watching this later, congratulations, you made it past. Um, but right now, boy, we are collectively going through one of the hardest times globally in our history. So you may be living with a chronic illness. On top of that, we're living with a pandemic, which has created a range of negative impacts, whether you've had the virus, which is obviously very debilitating, or if you haven't, and it's affected your finances, your job, your school, your emotional well-being, your resources, maybe your medical care, your ability to get in to see providers and get your treatments. On top of that, 2020 has also highlighted a long history of racial injustices, inequities, um, as well as it's been a time of great changes in, in political and cultural distress, which has brought a lot of people to a lot of stress, even within their family and friends. <clears throat> it's the holiday season, which we all like to think of the holiday season as a very idyllic time, but it is a season that actually can bring up a lot of emotional history or current stressors, sadness, isolation, financial challenges, loss, and more for people. And then of course, you've got your own stressors. So this was just six layers and more of stressors. And objectively, there's only so much that we can take. And the way that we balance it out is by building up our resources. Those are all the things Dr. Pavlovich just talked about, the importance of the stress management. Now, we can't always control what happens, but how do we react to it? How does it affect us emotionally and physically? The good sleep, the good nutrition, the seeking accommodations, and the exercise, even if it's movement that you enjoy, it doesn't have to be aerobic. Those build up our resources on the opposite end. So we kind of have this teeter-totter of stressors and resources. In addition to all of these things going on in our world right now, migraine has many comorbidities. And comorbidity means two things that occur more often together than by chance. It doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. It may be the case, or it may be that they all come from a shared underlying predisposition or a shared genetic trait. 
So migraine is comorbid with psychological conditions like depression, anxiety, panic disorder, PTSD, adverse childhood experiences, neurologic conditions like stroke, restless leg, sleep, conditions like insomnia, sleep apnea, respiratory and allergic conditions, other chronic pain conditions, fibromyalgia, and others, cardiac conditions. So you may also live with a kind of constellation of conditions in addition to migraine disease or other severe headache disease, which of course puts stress on you physically and emotionally. Very quickly, I wanted to come up with some of my favorite strategies for surviving and thriving with migraine. One, as I already said, Dr. Pavlovich told us how important those healthy lifestyle habits are. They really are. They are like exercise for your nervous system. The migraine brain is happier and more calm with a very regular routine, including those healthy habits. So Dr. Pavlich and I like to write those on a prescription pad right next to any medication. They're that important and they may make other treatments work better as well. Forgive me. Um, also, when I think about getting a diagnosis, did you know that of the 40 million Americans with migraine, only about a half have actually gotten a diagnosis from a healthcare professional or are seeking care? So think about talking to someone if you haven't. You may not know if you have migraine, but if you have severe headache, talk to your primary care doctor or another healthcare professional who can help you create a treatment plan. And treatments, as we're going to talk about, are such a range from medication to intervention to behavioral to a combination of all of them. We want you to feel empowered. So depression often goes along with feeling helpless and feeling hopeless. What are ways you get empowered? One is education, things that you're doing right now, reaching out and working with advocacy groups like following Society for Women's Health Research and others. Um, reclaiming your identity. It's easy when you live with a chronic illness, chronic disease to start to feel like that's who you are. You are a migraine patient. It's important to remember all the other things that you are, what you do, what you love, who loves you, what your roles are in society, at work, school, family, and try to keep those active and alive, even if your disability due to migraine or another reason has taken away your ability to participate as you'd like. Um, another advice I wanna give you is ask for and accept help. And here's, I wanna give you permission to accept help, and here's why. A lot of people want to help you. People want to help you because it also makes them feel better. So the next time someone asks, how can I help? Have a, 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 a way ready. Have a suggestion that they can help with your kids. They can help pick up something at the grocery store. They can uh, just do something, you know, have a friendly chat with you over Zoom, whatever it is. But go ahead and accept it. Because not only is it going to take a little tiny burden off of your shoulders, but they might feel better too. Sometimes we have to um, accept what we can't change. And migraine is a genetic disease that, as Dr. Pavlovich talked about, tends to get better at certain points in life, but it is for many people a chronic or long haul condition. So we really learn to manage it, not cure it. And again, that's what we're doing by talking to each other today. We have to adjust expectations. 2020 certainly may have not been the year we expected. This holiday season may be disappointing. Living with chronic migraine, the what it has done to your career, your family, your social life, your school, is probably not what you expected or living with migraine or another headache disease. But when we adjust those expectations and lower the expectations, we don't have as much disappointment, frustration, and guilt. And we want to adjust those for other people too, setting those realistic expectations for family members, for friends, for coworkers. So then people aren't disappointed. This is simply what you said you can do. Be kind and gentle to yourself and try to surround yourself with people who understand, people who support you, people you trust. You can find people on some of the moderated social media groups from the big organizations like the American Migraine Foundation, National Headache Foundation, and you might find other friends who are in the same boat and there's something about that that's very validating. Now I want to say there might be times when you want to get professional help. Please don't be shy about it. It's what we're here for. It's what we want to do. If anything starts to feel unmanageable, 
talk to your primary care professional, or reach right out to a mental health expert, a psychologist, a social worker, or you may even find that you do uh, look for um, a web-based approach, an app-based approach to learning some self-management, some cognitive behavior skills, some relaxation skills. Signs you want to think about are certainly depression, anxiety, if they become overwhelming or change, panic disorder, suicidal thoughts, please act on that right away. Don't be ashamed. Again, these are all comorbid with living with migraine. They're not your fault. You didn't cause them. But due to some brain chemistries and some genetics, you might experience these things. PTSD, self-harm, substance abuse. Anytime things are feeling overwhelming, talk to a primary care doctor, talk to a mental health professional. And there's a whole range of ways to get help today from in-person to, to apps and online um, information. Here's a couple uh, little images from our toolkit of ways that you can find help. And um, I, I talked about a lot of these, searching some websites, and those are listed in the toolkit, some websites that, that are scientific organizations. So they're going to get you to good providers who are knowledgeable and skilled. Asking your primary care doctor is always a way to go. Maybe an app, maybe a support group, maybe all of the above. Now, my last minute or two, I just want to remind you that for migraine prevention, preventing migraine attacks, there's three behavioral approaches that have empirical validation, scientific support, and are supported by the big scientific organizations. Those are going to be biofeedback, cognitive behavioral therapy, and relaxation training. The nice thing about these is they can work with medication or alone. They're great things to do during pregnancy when you can't take a lot of your medications. Um, they have long lasting effects and they also all improve depression, anxiety, and quality of life as well. So they're nice therapies to consider at any point in your life and what the skills you learn from them you will take forward with you. And to give you a quick overview, biofeedback is simply being hooked up to equipment where you are fed back information about the stress responses and relaxation responses in your nervous system, your heart rate, your breathing rate. Um, Cognitive behavioral therapy is a talk therapy where we look at cognitions that might be associated with depression, anxiety, behavioral strategies that help you live better and achieve your goals. And relaxation training helps you and your nervous system by calming your heart rate, slowing your respiratory rate. This is something you can learn from a psychologist or you might find an app or a web-based approach that you like basically just kind of giving the nervous system a break, 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, even 30 seconds of a lovely deep breath. And as I close, I'm gonna invite you all to take a lovely deep breath with me, breathe in through your nose. Hold, 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 and a big exhale. Breathe out stress and tension, shake it out, doing little stretches or wiggles. Take about 30 seconds any time that you're starting to feel tension, be it physical or emotional. Take a lovely cleansing breath. Blow out that stress and tension. It's good for your nervous system. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's so helpful. It's so, um, I think, uh, timely given everything happening right now in the world um, to think about how particular stressors might impact folks, um, particularly with respect to chronic conditions. Um, and I think taking a deep cleansing breath is important for us all. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to invite Karen Smith to share her screen now. Thank you, Karen. So Karen's journey as a patient advocate has been ongoing for many years. Um, she's worked to create a social media-based support group for people with migraine and is a published author, freelance writer, and mother of two. With her experience on social media and as a patient advocate, Karen is going to talk about social wellness and migraine. Karen, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be part of this. It's been a great experience being part of uh, SWHR's migraine uh, resource group. Um, my personal story, so I started experiencing migraine in my 20s, um, like Dr. Pavlovich talked about, um, they were primarily cycle-related. Um, but in my 40s, they dramatically increased. Um, and I embarked on a quest to uh, master my migraines before they mastered me. Um, I want to leave you with one thought, if you only take one thing away from this, is that um, 
wellness is a journey, not a destination. Um, I still have migraine, but I uh, have way fewer incidents today than uh, even just two years ago. Um, through a combination of things and through good luck and new medications, um, but um, it's a it's a path. I will always have migraine, I think. Um, so I will uh, take us through the problem with migraine. One of my favorite things to say uh, is that it's all in our heads. Um, nobody knows what it's like to experience your migraine, but you. Um, we have a saying in the migraine community that if you know one person with migraine, you know one person with migraine. So you know what it's like for that one person. Um, each of us end up experiencing different symptoms, different um, severity. When I began tracking my migraines uh, really strictly in my early 40s, um, I was tracking about 100 migraine events per year. So to do the math for you, that's a migraine every three and a half days, give or take. Um, it's a lot of migraines. Um, my issue isn't severity. My issue is frequency. So these were, uh, so the kinds of things I was looking to do were to reduce frequency of attacks, not necessarily worrying about severity. I have friends who have such severe migraines that they're um, so incapacitated, they have to address the severity side of things. So each of us are different. Um, so uh, being able to find a way to talk about uh, our migraine um, helps us be our own advocates and we can help our loved ones understand um, how migraine impacts us. I've got my own paper notes next to my computer so let me switch slides there too. Um, one of the things that the migraine toolkit talks about is about how um, migraine can affect your social relationships and having a good support system is really important. I want to remind you as a patient that you're in the driver's seat here. You decide how much and what kinds of details to share. I know plenty of people are uncomfortable sharing too much medical information with others, but talking about how migraine impacts you can help you create opportunities for empathy in the people that you're talking to, be it family members or uh, other folks that you work with, um, people that you regularly interact with. Um, and doing so can help you guide people to the kind of support that you need. Um, that's pretty important so that you're getting help that's useful, not help that um, adds to your burden when you're already hurting. Um, this is the most important thing I can say to anybody. It's not your fault. You're not a bad person for wanting that really good aged cheddar or a glass of red wine that lots of people think might be causing your migraine attacks. You're not a bad person for lacking the energy to get on the exercise bike or go for a run or do those things. Uh, as um, we discussed earlier in the presentations, finding an activity that you can do is important. Um, so I've personally found that weightlifting is lots of fun. I can't lift heavy on migraine days, but I can um, lift something most days. And um, finding that activity has been um, really helpful to me in uh, having an outlet and feeling also like I'm taking care of my body in the best way that I can. Um, around the food kinds of things, I, I, it is a common thing for others to think that, they're, um, that, that something you're eating is causing your migraine. Um, and you can go a little bit bananas trying to find every trigger. Um, even the people you love might help by um, offering input about uh, your diet or um, your choice of activities. And um, here's where we can guide people to the kind of help we need. I actually had to ask my husband to be a little bit less pushy with um, his thoughts when I was telling him about an attack. Um, I think he felt like if he could just find that one thing that was causing it and eliminate it, I'd never have another migraine. Um, the reality is I have migraine. Um, I'll probably always have migraine. Hopefully I have fewer as I age. Um, that's my goal. Um, but being able to treat and manage each event and uh, plan so that I am not taken by surprise, it has been my goal. And with that encouragement, um, I've been able to get better support from the people close to me. It's a profound bummer to feel like 
something out of your control causes you to miss out on favorite activities or causes you to go through them in extreme pain. Um, so plenty of us need to have some thoughts and some plans kind of prepared for either how we um, step out of something that's when we're unable to continue participating or how to manage. Um, I suggest making a plan right down. Um, that way, if someone is there to help, you can point them to your written plan and ask them to bring you something from the plan. It might be a cup of tea, an ice pack, um, something else. Um, practice some explanations. I give you some phrases here that you can consider. I wish I could be there. I need a rain check. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I might have a migraine, but I'll try to make it. Um, and you can always carry your backup meds. That's one of my main tips. I had one of my worst migraines ever in Las Vegas, of course. Um, and I chose the small purse rather than the regular large purse with all the extra medicines. And I forgot to throw a backup medicine in there um, and live to regret it. Um, it definitely um, helped me be a better planner in the future. Um, one of my uh, biggest challenges is managing stress, which is always a contributor to migraine. Um, for me, the stress of travel is actually one of my triggers, one of the only ones that I know for sure. And um, for, for me, I try to um, plan ahead because I know it might happen. Uh, and so I try to pack all the important stuff early. Uh, I make sure to pack extra medicines and things that make me feel more comfortable, um, a certain headband that's real tight on my head, for instance. Um, and I try to get that all done early enough so that I'm not panicked about things at the last minute. Um, so those are some examples. Lots of us get lots of advice, particularly once we get maybe more open about our experience with migraine. Um, and I guess here, I just wanna make sure you think through the fact that when people are giving you uh, advice, unsolicited or solicited, they're not being nosy, they're trying to help you. So try to rewrite that script when you're like, I don't need your input or I don't need to know that cheese might be a trigger. Uh, rewrite that, this person's trying to help me. Uh, and so here's a, some ideas for how to respond to that. Oh, I have a good plan I'm working on with my doctor, but thank you. I haven't heard of that before. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, you know, just even knowing that people care about you can help you feel a little bit better about what you're going through. As a parent, my kids have been unfortunately very familiar with what it's like to um, live with migraine. Um, and for them, the main thing is they need some reassurance and they need to know they can ask questions and they'll be able to get answers. Um, talk when you are feeling well so that you can make a plan for the days when you don't. Um, I promise that they will, uh, they will get through this themselves and knowing what it's like for a parent to experience migraine might help them have more compassion for others they encounter in their life who deal with other chronic ailments. And one of my tricks here is to focus on what you can do. And you get a very cute picture of my dog, by the way. He makes his own pillow forts. He hides inside the pillows on the couch, which is where I head when I have a migraine attack. Um, but focus on what you can do. You can cuddle with your kids. You can be read to. Um, a lot of times I need my eyes closed, but I can listen, sort of. I might doze off, but that's okay. Um, what kinds of activities can your kids engage in that won't make things worse for you? So coloring is a nice, quiet one that's not very messy. Um, you can be with your pet, getting fresh air. Sometimes even just going for a short walk can help. Um, ask your kids to help you, you know, give them helper roles. They want to be helpful and reassure them that you're, you're going to feel better soon. And I teased up a wasabi story at the beginning that I'll tell you real quick. Um, in, in engaging with others about my migraine, I have talked with plenty of people and I have a, a friend of the family who gave me the one weird trick that she uses when she gets a migraine where she takes a little bit of wasabi and she puts it on the inside of her nostrils and then she waits until you know, if she's really flowing and feeling, you know, open and finds that she gets pain relief that way. I have not chosen to take that suggestion myself. I think that sounds a little too crazy for me personally, but my point is you never know where your next good idea will come from. So um, I wish you all the best of luck and thank you so much for your time.
Thanks so much, Karen. Um, we really appreciate you spending the time to tell us about um, your journey and also your um, mechanism for dealing with migraine. So finally, I would like to welcome Jamie Sanders. Jamie is the author of the award-winning blog, The Migraine Diva, um, where she chronicles her journey with migraine and as a patient advocate. And she has lived with migraine since the age of two and her migraine attacks have been chronic and intractable for 15 years. Jamie is going to talk to us about intellectual wellness, specifically how to be a migraine advocate and how to advocate for yourself. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, and I'm so sorry that my dog is barking right now. His timing is impeccable. Um, please stop. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, the doorbell just rang. Um, so I will be talking about um, intellectual wellness. Um, and I, for some reason, cannot advance my slides. <laughs> so there we go. All right. Um, it's important to um, have an active participation in mentally stimulating activities when living um, with a uh, migraine or any chronic condition. Um, intellectual wellness refers to your active participation in mentally stimulating activities and seeking out new cultural community experiences. Intellectual wellness can help you to live a full and exciting life and allow you to feel better connected to your community. It's very important to feel like you have a connection to those that live a similar existence to you. Um, and finding those connections can really help you um, manage and cope with migraine a lot easier. And part of intellectual wellness is advocacy. And, oh my goodness, I'm having such, I'm having a horrible migraine today and it's showing. Um, and there we go. Um, Migraine advocacy, um, you can do this in many different, different ways. Um, promoting policies to improve the quality of life for people with migraine in your local schools, workplaces, and government. These are things um, that you can do um, locally, statewide, or federally. Sharing your story with community and loved ones so they better understand the experiences of individuals with migraine. You could do this like I do with my blog or just connecting with others on in support groups online or just being open and sharing your story with your family and friends. Pushing for policy change at a national level to improve big picture issues such as funding for research, paid leave, and healthcare training. I advocate because it is important to utilize my voice in a way where it will shine a light on everyone who lives with this disabling neurological disease. So many of us live in the dark, trying our best to navigate through life with an unpredictable and life-stealing illness. It is important that the world sees the true impact migraine has on the millions of people living with it, not only in this country, but across the globe. So for me, because I am intractable and live with um, migraine every day, um, and especially on a day like today where my pain is intensely high and I'm sh really, really struggling to get through this, doing something like this is giving my pain a huge purpose and it's keeping me engaged in the community. Um, so advocacy has been a real important piece of how I manage my migraine disease. And it helps me stay involved in a way where I can turn my pain into something with a bigger purpose. And there are different ways that you can become an advocate and use your advocacy. You can keep it simple. Advocating from home by sharing your experiences on so social media or starting a blog um, move Against Migraine is a great, great way to connect with others and share your story. Or you can go a little bit bigger and participate in a community race or fundraiser to raise money for migraine research, such as the organization Miles for Migraine. 
which puts on these amazing events, these walk, run, relax events across different uh, cities um, across the country. They have education days and youth events, great organization to participate in. And it's a great way to physically connect with other people with migraine. So if you wanna get from behind the screen and actually connect with others like yourself, that's a great way to do it. And you can go even bigger than that. Check out Headache on the Hill, which is an advocacy event that happens every year in Washington, DC, which is organized by the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy. It's a great way to advocate um, and share your story on the federal level. And it's, it, you just feel so empowered. It's a great way to see others doing the same thing, fighting through their migraine symptoms, but sharing in that same collective movement. It's a, it's a great, great thing to be a part of. So a little bit more about myself and how I got this journey to advocacy. Um, I was undiagnosed with abdominal migraine at two and had my first migraine attack at eight years old. And I fluctuated between low and high episodic for about 15 years throughout my childhood and adolescence. When I was 23, I had a three month long intractable migraine during the first trimester um, of my last pregnancy. And that was very, very eye opening for me, very different. And um, that instance changed migraine for me. Um, migraine showed up very different for me after that. At 27, I was diagnosed with chronic migraine and then I developed chronic daily headache and new daily persistent headache by the age of 28. Learning how to incorporate advocacy and wellness was an important step in learning to live with these, this daily pain. Learning how to navigate my disease created a space for me to, to become my best advocate. I educated myself about migraine and the best ways to support myself. It was important for me to know how to best manage migraine for me. Everybody's experience with migraine is different, but how it shows up for me, how it affects me personally, how it affects my family, what can I do to thrive within this disease instead of being annihilated by it, especially when you live with it on a daily basis because you feel defeated by it so much. Championing for my healthcare empowered me not to settle for less and to make sure that my voice was heard. I am an active participant in my healthcare. My physician and I have a partnership. It is not a dictatorship. This was the first step in my advocacy. Learning that I do have a voice, that I have a stake in my healthcare and where it goes and what I want and see for myself. That was the first step for me in learning that I do have a, a place in this and I do have a voice. Understanding how important that was led me to want that same experience for others. So I actively share how to self-advocate on my blog and social media channels because I want everybody to know that there is empowerment in your pain. You all have a voice. You all have a, a stake in your own self-care. And it's not selfish to put yourself first. And a lot of times I think a lot of us with migraine because we deal with so much internal stigma and as women, um, we have a lot of that mom guilt. And so we put ourselves on the back burner and we don't feel like we deserve to do things for ourselves. I'm here to tell you that you can and you should and you deserve to. Finding my voice has given me a sense of empowerment and purpose and finding my purpose in my pain has strengthened my self-esteem, my mental health and my overall self-image. Advocacy starts with you, and you can do this in all settings of your life. At home, ask for what you need and try not to feel guilty about it. It is okay not to be okay. If you're having a day where you just can't function, that's okay, it's not your fault. You did not ask to have this genetic disease, and it's gonna happen when you're just going to be unable to be everybody to everybody else. Um, 
So it's okay when you have those moments where you have to step back and take care of you. And it doesn't make you any less than a mother, a friend, a wife, an, or anything else to anybody else in your life when you need to take care of you in those moments. At work, you have access to reasonable accommodations, FMLA, possibly um, flexible work schedules. If you feel comfortable disclosing your condition, schedule a meeting with your HR manager for more information on how you can utilize these accommodations so that you can have a better experience at work um, and so that your productivity is not affected as much. When it comes to your family, share what you know about migraine with them. Bring a family member with you to your next appointment. If they have questions, let them ask those questions so that they can be answered, they can be fully informed about your disease and what's going on with your treatment and how they can better support you. With your healthcare providers, remember this is a partnership. Working together is key. And ways that you can help facilitate this, um, because a lot of times we don't have a lot of time with our healthcare providers, send your questions in advance, take notes, utilize telemedicine if it's accessible to you, and if you do not understand a treatment, ask for clarity. There are ways you can get involved in headache and migraine advocacy and learning what your rights are. Um, a great resource is visiting the Coalition for Headache and Migraine Patients website at headachemigraine.org slash get involved. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you all this afternoon. Amy, thank you so much. And we are hearing a lot via sort of messages from participants and attendees, as well as through the Q&A um, about your powerful message surrounding how you can um, take your experience and, and really turn it into um, an opportunity for advocacy. And we thank you and thank you so much for um, sharing your story, especially today. <laughs> so we really appreciate it. Um, I think we have a few minutes, a very few minutes for a few questions. And I can see that some of our panelists are um, responding directly, which is great. So if our panelists um, feel open to that, we really appreciate you doing that. Because I think given the short amount of time, we'll have maybe just a couple of questions here. I actually want to start um, with one question for, for all of you. Um, sort of as a migraine expert, and whether that's through, you know, your, your clin clinical work or as a patient, um, what is the number one lifestyle tip you would recommend to people with migraine? As I throw that out to, to each of you. Maybe we start with Yelena. <laughs> um. I roll my eyes because I always think of what I, what I advise, what I preach and what I do myself as a person with migraine. Um, to patients, I think the one, um, and, and we're, you know, I, in just a general comment in looking at the Q and A um, always, and, and first of all, thank you, Karen and Jamie for sharing your stories. Uh, they're so inspiring and takes so much courage and vulnerability to share. Um, and um, you, Jamie, saying that the advocacy gives purpose to your pain. It just, you know, really cut. And um, those are important words and they need to be heard. So thank you. Um, so I think in these uh, um, in these webinars, in the whenever we talk in our uh, in in most of the things that Don and I do, uh, is generally people who are severely affected by headache, right? So the the advice that I give to my patients really varies depending on how severely where where on their migraine journey, what is their burden of disease. So for someone who has episodic headache, a college student with you know, fresh kind of episodic headache, five to 10 attacks a month. A lot of them, that is education. Treat, recognize, get to know yourself, trust your body. What Karen was saying about everyone else giving you an advice about this, don't need that. Trust your own body. You know your body better than I can ever know it. You know, don't, if, if a medication is not working for you and it's making you sick, don't wait for three weeks to talk to me 
while you're getting ill, just stop taking the medication. So that kind of education, I think, is the primary thing um, that I educating all the patients. And then as some of the Q&A has come through, of course, there are people who have daily migraine, who really and nothing seems to work. And th those stories are so heartbreaking. The hope, my hope is that all the work we do, that eventually, even for the most challenging of the challenging cases, eventually that we will find something that works. Um, but the one thing that is sometimes hard is, I have had patients who have asked, what if this never changed? I think also the reality and what Karen hint upon this, hinted upon this, of um, the idea that we can be fixed and that it's only about finding a fix puts us in those times. And I say us, because as a person with migraine who's experienced this into a psychological bind where we feel even more inadequate. So sometimes, and Dawn can speak to the psychological actual constructs of how uh, one deals with this in cognitive behavioral therapy and other aspects, that's not my expertise, but sometimes for a period of time, making peace with that state and then working from that angle is sometimes actually the best we can do. And so finally, for me, it's that, not for my, me personally, not feeling the stigma. And, and I've, I've said this openly, like how often, how easy it is to fall in that, how often, how hard it is to step out of personal stigma of um, what migraine does to us and how hard it is to deliver and live with migraine sometimes. Thank so you so much. No, I think that's super helpful. And again, I, I know we have a limited amount of time, so I apologize. We'll stay on a little bit longer if we can. I understand folks might need to hop off. I have two questions I really do wanna get to um, before we um, sort of wrap up for the day. And I would mention um, this is being recorded. We will share the link with all of our registrants so that they can come back and watch it as well. Um, but for Jamie, I have one question for you. Knowing that one of your passions is health disparities in migraine, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that and let us know kind of what you think is important for migraine patients who are also people of color or who come from historically marginalized communities. I appreciate that uh, question. Um, I just, for me personally, it's a, I have a bit of a dicho dichotomy with my background. Um, my father worked in a federally qualified health center and that's where we went for our care. And so the positions that I saw were diverse. They were people of color. And so growing up, I felt safe and they spoke a language that you know, I spoke um, and there was never this feeling of having to um, code switch or speak differently um, or to um, change the way that I presented myself in order to be seen or validated. And as an adult, that was completely different. Um, and as a per woman of color, the issue that um, I experience is one, just as a woman, my pain is dismissed quite frequently. Um, and as a woman of color, I've either had my pain just completely ignored or I've had to constantly have to answer the question, well, what are you doing for your pain? As implying as if I'm not doing enough. Um, and I'm constantly having to validate my own experience before I can get any treatment. And usually this happens in the urgent care setting. Um, and there is this pressure, or there's not, I wanna say pressure, but there's this, this, this I, I have to make sure I show up a certain way. I don't know about anybody else who's not of color but I know, because I've been in this, this body since I was a child, and it's something that we've done since I was little, we would get dressed up to go to the doctor. Because if you looked like you were educated and you spoke well, then you were treated better. So even going to urgent care in an extreme amount of pain, as much as I want to go in my pajamas and my slippers and my hair not done, I comb my hair, put on a little mascara, get dressed, and make sure I look a certain way so that you know, they accept me. 
because I have this fear that if I don't look the part, it's going to be a lot harder for me to get my treatment, even though I have a protocol and I have all this history with me. Um, and my story is not synonymous to me. This is something that happens to many people of color or anybody who is marginalized. And this is a conversation that we don't have enough. And this is a barrier that many people experience. And it creates a level of medical trauma for a lot of us to the point where I don't even want to put myself in that situation, even though I desperately need care, because it's not worth the anxiety of what may happen because of who may walk through that door and how they may treat me or make me feel. And is that worth it? No. And do I need to, you know, prove myself and make, my fe make, my, make, me, make myself feel seen? No. I'd rather stay home and suffer and just kind of seep through it than deal with that. And that's been something that in circles within people of color, we can all agree that we've experienced multiple times. So we do need to address this. We need to understand that the way other ethnic groups and cultures um, deal with pain, describe their pain, um, is very different. The way they treat their pain is different. Um, culture, you know, culturally, there might be, you know, a lot of things they do naturally, and they want to do that first. Um, we need to talk to them on different levels um, and really get to understand what it is that this person um, thinks about their pain, how they perceive it, um, and how we can better understand, you know, what they think this is. And um, that's something that we're desperately lacking. And um, it's very, very um, frustrating as a woman of color to have to navigate this industry and be very cognizant that I'm in this skin and that many times that's the first thing people see and that's how I'm going to be approached and treated instead of a person walking in with this disabling disease that I've had for 40 years. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's really important. I think there's a number of things we've been thinking about um, at SWHR, but I think broadly too. And, and one of those is this common theme of, um, you know, thinking about how, how you talk about your level of pain um, and your symptoms, and then that idea of being dismissed. And so I think it's really important to highlight that. I um, mean, I think that leads into my one final question I think we have time for, but we're seeing a lot about this um, in the Q&A and sort of a common theme, particularly related to um, the potential to maybe have folks go back into the office at some point in the maybe near future um, is this idea of sort of workplace accommodations and how to approach this with your employer. Um, and I wonder how each of you might recommend approaching this issue, um, particularly when we think about what expectations may be. A lot of people are teleworking right now and maybe their symptoms have been lessened and they've been able to find some sort of relief or ability to um, manage their um, disease, but also their lives a little bit differently. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. And maybe Karen, we can start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, I will tell my experience during the pandemic in particular during the early part um, is that I had a decrease in migraine events. Um, I believe my best guess is that for the first time in my adult life, I was able to um, sleep according to my body's natural schedule. Uh, which is a little off what, off kilter from what uh, the U.S. standard is. So I would go to bed around 12 or 1 and wake up around 9 or 10. Um, and it's I'm a freelancer, so I have the ability to set my own schedule. I apologize to everyone who does not have that ability. But I do think that employers are embracing the idea that there are many ways to be productive at work as they're seeing people produce well, even while home uh, or in some alternative uh, workplace. And uh, so I'd 
I guess I'd encourage everyone to think about whether um, there is something like that. And, you know, one person with migraine, that's the thing that seemed to make a difference to me. Um, maybe there's something that you've noticed makes a difference to you. Maybe it's that you need a longer lunch break so that you can do an exercise routine in the middle of the day. Uh, and, um, you know, maybe it's joining a fitness center that's near your workplace so that you have showers available and so you can freshen up. You know, things like that. It might be something uh, creative like that. I also just before I go first wanted to say I think my mom attended so thank you mom for being here um, and supporting me always um, and that as a patient the one thing I talk to other people who suffer from migraines the most about is talking to their doctor and medical providers about things so I just want to remind people that migraines are something to speak to physicians about and that there are medicines besides Excedra migraine available to you, as well as all the wonderful things we've talked about. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for that. And hello to your mom. We love a good mom shout out around here. It's happened to me as well. Um, I don't know, Dawn, Yelena, Jamie, anything else to add sort of as, a, as final remarks here? Well, um, SWHR has actually put together some great resources on coping with living with chronic illnesses in the workplace that you've um, gotten advice from lawyers, from advocates, from physicians, from psychologists, and have some great resources. So hopefully you can let folks know where those are on the website. I learned a lot when I was reading those resources that SWHR has put together. I saw several people have asked this question, and of course, this is a great source of anxiety. Work for us not only is a financial need, but for many people, it's also a great part of our identity and something that we worked hard for and are proud of and want to be able to do. Um, so um, talking to HR, should you feel comfortable, as Jamie and Karen both put in their presentations is important. Um, having that doctor's note can be important if you do have a, a primary care or other type of doctor who's already made that diagnosis for you and can write it down. And Dr. Pavlik and I will write on, on our, our letterhead, um, according to the Americans Dis with Disabilities Act, we know that you know that you need to offer this person accommodations, including things like being able to keep water near them, being able to take their breaks, being able to change their overhead lighting or go to a place with more comfortable lighting, having a perfume and odor free workplace. Um, there's, there's a dozen things that are pretty simple that Dr. Pavlovich and I write frequently in letters. We're happy to write those and Society for Women's Health has actually put together a list that you can bring right to your employer that might make your situation more comfortable. But also, I think, as everyone said, one of the silver linings of this pandemic <clears throat> may be a bit more flexibility for some people in their ability to telecommute, possibly to change hours. Um, in the school space, Dr. Amy Gelfin and her colleagues just published on the great benefits to teenagers of a delayed school start. We know that that sleep is so important to people <clears throat> living with migraine, getting enough, and getting it at the right time for your body. And <clears throat> Karen mentioned being a night owl. I'm a night owl. And um, so getting it to the right phase for you might also be important. So while you may not think these are worthy things to talk to your healthcare professional about or talk to your HR about, they are very valid. And for some people, these might really make a good difference. So don't be shy and reach out to SWHR for the backup if you, if you want it and need it. I would just add two more things to that, and that is um, that odor triggers are often a big trigger for a lot of us, and if not overtly a trigger, exacerbating factor. So with COVID protocols, hand sanitizer, and, um, and just increased cleaning procedures, I know that they're triggering me all the time, and I wear an N95 the whole time, and it's still triggering me. Um, so that, that is another factor. And I would say document it now with your healthcare provider so that they know, so that they can write it in a letter if you need a letter three or six months from now. So I would keep, that would be my advice. Keep kind of triggers, keep things that bother you. Document now with them, let them know so that then it's not out of nowhere. And the other 
thought it is un somewhat unusual because we know but what uh, goes in with teenagers having delayed phase of sleep and sleeping in i have noticed that a lot of college students who have struggled really had big time struggles going away to college and sharing rooms you know dealing with roommates dealing with everything else food and everything that college brings with it are actually now doing spectacularly well from home kids with migraine kids college students with migraine who are living from home at least who are my patients seem to be doing so well um, they're doing well academically they're doing well psychologically so if you happen to have a child who has migraine though we you know everyone wants their child to go away and have that experience maybe a semester from home in the time while this is going on and it will be going on for some time may not be bad for a college student with migraine so just you know creative options i think seeing this pandemic and all the awful things that have happened with it but also seeing the fact that it's open possibilities for creative options and maybe seizing on some of those creative options mm -hmm. True. Dr. Pavlovich, I like what you said about let people know early, whether it is college. And I like to advise parents in college, young adults, or whatever age you're going to college, to reach out early to the office, maybe called an office of disabilities or an off some type of word like that. Get to know them during orientation week, not during finals week. Get to know them, bring them your medical notes, start a, start a relationship with them, and they can advocate for so many things you wouldn't even know. All sorts of additional time on tests, additional tutoring, ability to use a laptop to take notes, ability to record. There's so much help available when you do start to ask. Um, and, and the same is true in the workplace. So the important key to that is documenting and documenting early. And then also, as, as Jamie talked about so eloquently, the advocating. And Jamie and Karen both said this. This is not your fault. It's okay to not be okay. And do not be shy about advocating for yourself. These are your rights. You have legal protections in place. Don't be afraid to use them. You deserve them. And Society for Women's Health and the American Migraine Foundation and the National Headache Foundation are all here. Um, and the Alliance for Headache Disorders, we are all here to back you up. Thank you so much. Jamie, last thoughts. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that you, you know, just said that as a great segue, because I just want to just end on um, this. This focus is living well with migraine. And for me, the biggest part of that is perspective. Um, it's so easy to fall into the pit of the thief that migraine is because it steals so much from our lives. But when you choose to change your perspective and focus on what it is that you still have despite migraine, it really does make a difference in how you get through the day. And for me personally, since I still live with pain every day, it's small things. I was able to get up and make my cup of coffee sit down and, and play with my dog, watch a Harry Potter movie with my kids, or make a meal. Those things bring happiness to me because I'm still able to get up and physically do that. And before there was a time where I wouldn't focus on that. And it's important to change your perspective and look at the things that do bring you positivity, do bring you joy, do bring you happiness and focus on that. Migraine is going to be here and it's going to, you know, rip some things away from you. Yes, that's, that's going to happen, but we don't have to dwell on that. And using this toolkit is going to help us focus more on those positive things in our lives and how to cope better with those moments when migraine comes in and tries to wreck our day. Thank you so much. I think that's a perfect place, a uh, perfect message, I think, to, to leave the audience with. Um, thank you all again so much for your time, to our panelists, to our attendees. We so appreciate it. We're getting really wonderful feedback and lots of um, supportive notes here through the, the chat. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to the new Migraine Patient Toolkit through our um, Migraine Network. Um, and we really appreciate and want to recognize all of their hard work on this as well. 
um, and you have those folks listed here. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure we appropriately recognize them. Um, and, and finally, another um, thank you to our sponsors, Amgen, Impel, Eli Lilly, and Novartis. Um, please remember to take a look at both of our migraine toolkits um, on our website. They really do contain a wealth of information um, and material for individuals with migraine, much more than we were able to include today, although I think we got a really good comprehensive look at a lot of the, the content here. Um, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar and a link to the toolkits to everyone who registered for um, today's webinar, so please um, keep an eye on your email for that. And with that, thank you again so much for joining us.